You're watching KCMI TV. Well, I'm so glad uh, you joined me tonight. It's so good to see each and every one of you and be a wonderful experience tonight just to share the word of the Lord with you. Uh, I have something on my heart <clears throat> that I want to uh, take a journey through the scriptures and talk to you about because I think that this will be very pertinent to so many of you that um, are living for the Lord. And I want to talk to you about the joy of the Lord. And of course, you know, we've in the last couple of years experienced such a um, heaviness in the earth and uh, not just in, in the United States, but in so many countries around the world. It seems like the whole world has had to deal with a spirit of heaviness. And um, the Bible has so much to say about uh, the joy of the Lord. And there's a lot of confusion, especially for believers, as to what the joy of the Lord is. And uh, if you would ask a lot of people, uh, tell me what you think the joy of the Lord is, they would say, well, it's, it's happiness and it's excitement. Um, it's a great anticipation of, of what's getting ready to happen in their lives. But uh, that's not what joy is. Joy is not an emotion. It's a position in Christ. It's the ability to see in the Spirit what God hath prepared for those that love him. And so I want to start off tonight by reading out of the book of Hebrews. Um, I love the book of Hebrews. And uh, the 12th chapter comes on the heels of the 11th chapter, which is such a great chapter of faith. And so uh, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about, or we're surrounded, not with just a small group of witnesses, but a great cloud of witnesses. You know what this means? It means that there is a tremendous, innumerable company of men and women that have lived their life on earth and came out with great victory. So it says they are a, a cloud of witnesses. So it says to you and I, let's lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, this is really not my key verse, but um, it leads up to the key verse. In verse 2, it says, So looking, this gives us the answer. How do we lay aside? And, and most of us are not dealing with sin in our life. We're, we're dealing with weights things that are pressing on us, that are heavy, that, that didn't come because we have failed, but because of the divine purpose that God has in yours in my life, that the enemy wants to weight us down. So he tells, he said, we need to lay these things aside, and we need to run with patience the race that is set before us. So then we say, well, well, pastor, that's all great, but how do we do that? Very next verse, looking unto Jesus. Uh, why would it say that, looking unto Jesus? Because he's our example. If you want to know how to navigate difficult times, look to Jesus. And it says in the next part of this verse here, it says, he is the author and the finisher of our faith. There's other scriptures that talk about he's the first and the last. He's the alpha and the omega. So there's a principle set in this scripture that says not only is God the author, in the beginning was God. He is also the finisher. So when Jesus went back into heaven, the Bible says he sat down on the right hand of the Father and he had made an utterance in, he in the earth. He said it's finished. So Everything that Jesus needed to accomplish, he accomplished in the earth. And so there's nothing left that's lacking. This is why it says he's the often the finisher of our faith. And I was talking to a, a, a wonderful pastor friend of mine, and he made such a beautiful point. He said, if Christ is the author and he's the finisher, then 
you and I, we, we are starting from the beginning and we're looking ahead. God, because he's already finished, works backwards to where we're at. So it means that God is moving from victory and fulfillment back to a place to where you and I are still trying to achieve it. So when we pray to the Lord and we're saying, God, help us, the Lord says, I already know the end from the beginning because I'm moving from a finished place. I am moving from victory back to where you're walking in faith, and so God is not shaken. So you say, well, how about Jesus? How did he do that? It says about Jesus, it says, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So how could he sit down at the right hand of the throne of God? He ended in victory. But this is what I want to extract from the scripture for you. It says this about Jesus. He endured the cross and he despised the shame. And we don't have time to digress back into the scriptures and talk about the horrible ordeal that Jesus went through at Calvary. We know this. I mean, not only deal with physical pain, he was dealing with spiritual anguish. He was dealing with the failure of his disciples. Uh, his prized disciple had just cursed and betrayed him. His oldest disciple had sold him for 30 pieces of silver. He's watching his mom go through anguish as she's beholding her son being tortured to death. And so he's going through immense things. Isaiah said his visage was marred more than any man. So how did Jesus survive the cross the Bible said he endured it. It couldn't get him. It couldn't stop him. It couldn't make him give up. How did he do that? It said, for the joy that was set before him. Because he was the author and the finisher, Jesus could see the end of where he was. Sometimes the enemy will try to get you so focused on the hopelessness it looks like of a situation that you're in, that he causes you to lose your vision or your spiritual ability to see beyond that by faith. Uh, the Bible says this about you and I, it says that we walk by faith and not by sight. Uh, people who are not saved can only see in the natural, these eyes. But people who are Christians who've been born again when they get in a situation where the natural eye says this can't be fixed, it's impossible, the joy, the joy, the ability to see beyond the moment. And when Jesus, hallelujah, he didn't discount the pain he was in. He did not discount what he was going through, the reality of it. But he said, I can handle this because I see the joy that is set before me. I see what God has prepared for me. And right now, for most of us, we're gonna have to have the ability to stop looking at the moment and get the eyes of Jesus and be able to look forward and see that there is a payoff for you and I. Um, people that, fail in difficult times, it's because they lose their joy. Uh, Revelations, I think it, it talks about, it says that the enemy uh, is trying, or it might be in the Old Testament, it says, and in Daniel, I think it is, it says the enemy is trying to wear us out, wear out the saints, that we just get tired of fighting, and we just finally say, okay, I give up, do what you want. You never give up. You never stop. Um, the Bible in, I think it's in, um, Nehemiah, the eighth chapter and verse 10 says this about joy. It says the joy of the Lord is our strength. David said this, he girds me with strength to do battle. So 
you don't have to just be overcome with laughter and giddy and all of these sayings when you're in the midst of the battle. I understand that. I'm in a battle right now. But what's getting us through this is the joy of the Lord that we are not looking at the impossibleness of where we are, but with we're looking ahead to the joy that is set before us. God sees the answer. He sees the resolution. He sees the devil being defeated in your future. And you just, you allow the faith realm to tell you that, yes, I'm in a battle, but it's not forever. God will come through. This is where Paul, um, I think it's in, um, let's see if I have it here. This is a wonderful portion of scripture. It's in um, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 12 and verse 9. He said, my grace, this is what the Lord spoke to Paul. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Now we go back to the other verse that said, the joy of the Lord is our strength. How does that happen? Because God causes us to have his strength in times of our weakness. He said, that's when my grace is perfected, comes to its fullness. That when we get in those times that we don't know the way out, that we're, we wonder, Lord, how will we manage this? How will we deal with this? The Lord says, my joy, hallelujah, will be your strength. Um, joy, and I think that many of you would agree with me on this. A lot of you that I talk to and I minister to, you're seasoned veterans of the Lord. You got battle scars. And there's many of us now that can say after, for me it's, I think I've had the Holy Ghost for 58 years and had a lot of dark times. But I can truthfully say, the joy of the Lord will get you through any trial, will get you through any hardship, because the joy of God is your strength that keeps the enemy from wearing you down and not allowing you to survive. Uh, one day, right after the, the loaves or the disciples came to Jesus and um, they were talking to him and he said, my meat, or he said, what sustains me, what fulfills me? Is the, he said, I have meat that you don't know, know of. And they said, well, did somebody bring in some food? And Jesus looked at me and said, you don't understand. He said, what fulfills me and what strengthens me is to do the will of my Father. That's my joy. That's why Jesus, at the end of his ministry, could despise the cross and endure the shame because he had prayed in the garden, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. When he realized, he knew that it was the will of God for him to go through this time, he said, my meat, what gives me strength, hallelujah, is to know that I am doing the will of my Father. That's why he had joy that was set before him. Um, in John 15 and 11, Jesus said this, he said, I want my joy to remain in you so that your joy may be full or be complete. It is impossible to long-term live for God in victory if you don't have joy. I, I've seen so many believers over the years that, um, you know, you, you get with them in one time and, man, they're so on fire and they're ready to, to charge hell with a bucket of water. And then the least little thing happens and they're so depressed and discouraged, they're, they're looking for medication to get them through it. That's because they don't have the joy of the Lord. They live by their emotions. There's gonna be times when life is, is really great. 
and you do have happiness. But there are other times as a believer, you have a mark on you that the enemy is coming after you with everything that's in him because you are a hindrance to his kingdom. And Jesus said, he said, my joy uh, might remain in you. And, um, you know, I, I've heard people over the years make this remark. They say, Pastor, I, I, I'm just so dry. I just, I don't have, uh, I don't have any strength. I'm just dry. Um, in the book of John, uh, it says this, that we are going to draw water out of the wells of salvation. Water is what keeps you from being dry. We know that water is the most important element to sustain a life. You can go 40, 50 days without food and lip, but you can't go very few, few days at all without water. Water is what gives you life. That's why Jesus said, I am the living water. So this verse is talking about drawing water out of the wells of salvation. But you know how it says we do it? With joy. With joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. And this is why so many Christians are so dry and they can't hardly survive. It's because they don't have any joy, so they don't have a bucket. That joy is what allows you to dip down into the nature of Christ. And the Bible says that out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water. Joy is not when everything's great. It's the knowledge and the revelation that we can see beyond the moment. Proverbs 29 says this, that where there is no vision, the people perish. Part of what joy is, is vision. You know, we talk about every year we, ha we have a service at the beginning of the year and we have our people write their vision. Many of you have written your vision and, and sent it in and it's the vision for the year. Vision means something that hasn't yet happened, but you're declaring and you're anticipating and you're going to tailor make your actions, your thoughts and your life to accommodate that vision to coming into existence. If you can't see beyond the moment, then you perish because you get so overwhelmed with what's happening at that time that it takes all the life out of you. You just become dry and, and brittle. Um, one of the most powerful verses, I'm sure most of you are thinking about this right now as I'm talking on joy. Psalms, I think, 16, it says this. Because we ask ourselves, then, Pastor, where do I get joy? It says, in his presence, his fullness, absolute, complete joy. How can that be? Because when you get in the presence of the Lord, you get exposed, hallelujah, to the greatness of God. You see him in one moment and he turns and then you see a whole nother side to him and he turns again and you see another flash of the nature of Jesus. And as you stand in the presence of the Lord and that glory of who he is begins to radiate upon you. You know what that is? God begins to let you soak up his ability to be able to start from the finished work, the faith realm, and looking back, hallelujah. The Bible says looking into Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. That's what happens when you get in the presence of the Lord. There, there are times where over the years I, I've been overwhelmed with things and you go to prayer and you don't even know how to pray about it. It's just, it's so big. And I've learned this, that when I get to that place, I just start praising the Lord. I just start praising him for who he is. Lord, I thank you how great you are. God, I thank you, hallelujah, for your mercies. I thank you that you're creator of all things. I thank you, God, that the devil can never overcome you. I thank you that you're a present help in time of trouble. I thank you, God, that when I'm overwhelmed, you lead me to the rock that is higher than I. You know what that does? It begins to release 
that joy, that ability that the enemy then cannot. You're casting off the weights. This is why it's so important for believers to pray on a daily basis. The Bible says that our outward men perish, but our inward men is renewed day by day. How is that? Because we're drinking of the living water as we partake of the presence of the Lord. Um, Romans 15 and 13 says this, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So through the power of the Holy Ghost, you can never have faith if God has not fill, filled you with joy. Joy is the ability to look at the impossible and say, I still believe that God cannot lie. Um, Romans 14 and seven, it says this, for the kingdom of God is not natural things, it's not meat and drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Did you know that in difficult times that you can have great joy? Paul said this. He said, um, I, I've been prophesied to. He said that my life is going to be filled with afflictions and bondages. He said, but none of these things move me. Why? Because he had the joy of the Lord. He was girded with the joy of the Lord to walk through this. And one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. Um, and I want to read this verse because I was just going through uh, studying today and um, this is in, in Isaiah chapter 61. Give me, I'm a little slow here referencing my... Um, and I'm going to start with verse 1 out of, out of Isaiah 61. It says, the Spirit of the Lord God. I love this verse. Jesus, this is one of the first verses he quoted in his ministry. He said, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. He said, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes. And he said, the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The Lord said, I have been appointed. That's what Jesus said when he, after he came out uh, and he was anointed, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. God does things in exchange. He said, I'm going to, for those of you that mourn, and there are so many things that can happen in life that bring us to that. He said, I'm going to give you the oil of joy for those that mourn. I hope as I speak to you tonight that you can feel in your home or wherever you're at the oil, hallelujah, of joy that God is, is putting in your life. And um, I just have a couple of more points. But when David fell in the Old Testament, he fell in... Um, he had killed uh, Uzziah and the, the husband of Bathsheba. Then he had taken Bathsheba's wife and, you know, committed adultery. And after a year later, you know, he, God finally sends a prophet, I think, Nathan to him. And David realizes the enormity of what he has done. And when he begins to pray, this is what he prayed. He said, Lord, restore to me. He doesn't ask God for the kingdom back. He doesn't ask God for his reputation back. He said this, would you restore unto me the joy of thy salvation? 
David understood as a prophet and as a king, I cannot make it through life that if I'm never going to repeat this sin, then I need the joy of thy salvation. And he said, God, will you restore to me the joy of my salvation? When the enemy can take your joy, he will stop your purpose dead in your tracks. You will never be able to fulfill the purpose for which God created you for, saved you for, delivered you for, without this joy in your life. I want to end uh, with this. Paul said, um, he said, I have fought the fight and I've kept the faith. He said, and I have finished my course with joy. May it be said of all of us that if we die because God tarries, that it will be said of all of us, they finished their course with joy, never lost their vision. Tình yêu mới hôm qua nay lại lùng băng giá Ôi người yêu dấu ơi Người chiếm lấy tim ta nay phụ phàng xa vắng Thôi thì cuộc tình đó Chiều nay ta bơ vơ trên cát dài hoang vắng Tiếc thương cho cuộc tình ta nhìn sóng vô miên man thương cho đời cay đắng người ơi có biết hai cha tình yêu ta như muôn vàng giấc mơ mong mãi và những ước mơ cho đêm về ta vẫn mãi bên nhau hãy đến một lần thôi lời thôi mãi mãi không bao giờ lìa xa tình yêu ta như lá vàng bay xa thật xa cùng bay cao nắng trôi về cuối chân trời xa nếu như ta vẫn mãi là những chiếc lá bay lung hờ thì người ơi xin nhớ mãi